Hi everyone, it's um, just gone one o'clock my time, so I think we can we can make a start. Um, I can see a number of you uh, already in the room, so welcome and uh, thanks for being so punctual. Uh, my name is Juliet and I'm the External Events Officer at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Really looking forward to this conversation on why inclusion matters for a green post-COVID recovery. Um, today's event is part of the IIED debate series and hosted in partnership with the Green Economy Coalition and we're really happy and excited to be partnering for this important conversation on inclusion. Um, so yes, I think that is it from me. Um, I'm going to now hand over to Laura Kelly, who is the Director of the Shaping Sustainable Markets Research Group at IIED and who's going to be our chair for today. Thanks very much, Juliet, and uh, I'd like to uh, join Juliet in welcoming you all here to this webinar uh, this afternoon. It's great. Um, we've uh, organised this because we've got speakers from Asia and from Latin America, um, and hopefully we've got participants from, from those regions as well, because this is a really key global issue for us. COVID has ravaged economies and countries across the world, and the opportunities for economic recovery being green and more inclusive are being talked about increasingly. But the key question is, how do we actually do that? And it's really good to work with GEC on um, promoting the work that they've been doing over the last four years, um, working with local partners um, on what green and inclusive economic transition means and I think there are some valuable lessons in there that we're going to explore today and it's a really great uh, set of speakers that we've got I'll introduce everybody briefly but you can see more uh, background on them in the um, the chat box so uh, first of all we have um, Stuart Worsley who is the Dialogues Director at the Green Economy Coalition and Stuart's been working with our hub partners to, to really um, get these uh, dogs working, uh, with local level participation and actually um, bringing the right people together to discuss uh, the issues to, to help ensure that civil society voices influence the policy processes. The two partners who we've got joining us today are Zenat Nadazi from uh, Development Alternatives in India. Um, Zenat is one of their associate directors uh, and has been working in this area for the last 20 years. We've got Luis Prado, the executive producer at uh, Liba Lula in um, Peru. Peru is one of the countries that's really been hit very badly by COVID. So it will be great to get their perspectives on how green and inclusive recovery can help. what has been a huge economic shock for them. We're also very happy to be joined by Thibault Podovin from the um, European Commission. Um, he works on issues around green economy and green transition. It's really great to get um, their perspectives, and they've been a strong supporter of, of uh, the GEC. And also Najma Mohammed, who is the policy director at the Green Economy Coalition, and is responsible for um, the research report that um, uh, is a, a lot of what of today's um, discussions are based on. And again, the link to that is in the chat box. So we've got a lot of speakers. We've got a really interesting topic. So um, I want to let the discussions commence. So I'll start by handing over to Stuart to give an overview of the dialogues process to date. Stuart. Good morning. Good I should say. My, my name is Stuart Worsley and I work with the Green Economy Coalition and I'm the director of the country programmes and I oversee our dialogues work. Lasting change doesn't actually happen unless lots of people want it. And even brilliant ideas struggle to get off the ground when very few people see the point. We've shown that involving and working with people who are worst affected by environmental and social problems, change can happen quickly. This inclusion of people who do not normally participate in planned change processes is important. Inclusion is normally stated as a moral thing to do based on human rights where everyone is afforded similar opportunity and consideration. But it's also been perceived to be inefficient to getting things done and it's seen as a moral cost perhaps. It's rarely described as a practical measure and normally it's seen to incur this moral cost that detracts from efficiency. Today, we're gonna to show that participation has in fact 
accelerated green economy transition in seven lower and middle income countries. We will show that for systems change, inclusion is not a nice to have, it's a must have. Yet there's been very little investment in finding out what matters to people or to involve them in bringing about sustainable change programs around the world. Instead, investment has defaulted to work on expert defined national level policy agendas. With the support from the European Commission, the Green Economy Coalition has run a series of country initiatives to build a critical mass of public demand and to connect this to the evolution of important national policies. We've done this in Peru, India, the Caribbean, Senegal, Uganda, South Africa, and Mongolia. And each country, work has engaged on, pe on what people think matters. And from this basis, we've engaged policy. In these countries, what matters has been air pollution and soil depletion in India and Mongolia, unfair business bias against green enterprise in Peru, South Africa and the Caribbean, failing river systems in Uganda, small scale fishing and farming systems in Senegal. And in each country, we've worked with people who are worst affected by these issues to find out what they see and what they experience, and what they're doing to fix the problems and what they're finding out and what they would like to see happen. At the same time, we have convened national green economy policy platforms to bring policy makers and power players into conversations with affected people. And in each case, there has been emergence of new solutions that have taken hold and have spread. We want to share this success with you, but we have changed policies and we have accelerated green economy action. And this is the key. And the key to our approach has been inclusion implemented through our dialogues approach. Our dialogues program has generated strong evidence in support of both the necessity of inclusion in green economy transition processes and in the efficiency or efficacy of the participatory dialogues approach in enhancing such inclusion. In seven countries, green economy dialogues have sought to build a critical mass of coherent public demand to stimulate policy action in response to evidence from such demand. Our hub networks and their dialogue and brokering processes have been catalytic. They have accelerated green economy transition beyond that possible with just bureaucratic processes. They have accelerated and enabled governments to implement and operationalize plans and strategies more effectively and efficiently with greater distributed and inclusive benefits. Government bodies have seen that participatory processes add value to policy, implementation and action, and that dialogues have helped harmonize government action. They have increased participation, learning, networking, and this has led to increased ownership, adaptation, and sustainability. This is leading to scale. They have changed people's mindsets that taking collective action is worthwhile. Network stakeholders have been able to provide evidence to influence policy. Building a connected critical mass has elevated green economy concepts with the public and the media. They brought new voices and they have injected greater urgency and demand into green upon economy transition policy debates and processes. They have improved the range, depth and nature of more inclusive participation. That's my phone telling me to stop. You've got, you've got another minute, Stuart. They have improved the range, depth and nature of more inclusive participation and have made for better evidence. They have improved downwards and upwards communication flows and connectivity. They have fostered constructive relationships, networks and platforms. They have linked and connected local, national and regional levels. Dialogues have strengthened wider connections with other green blue initiatives, both nationally and regionally. We think this is significant. And at this moment in time where change is needed as we confront COVID, climate change, biodiversity loss, social crisis and poverty, we now need the involvement of people to shape and drive more change more than ever. So Peru and India's stories are samples of the whole that are inspiring. And I'd like to pass over now to Zenat to tell you what's been happening in India. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Suat. 
um, it's it's lovely to be here and um, good good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on which time zone people are from. And uh, I let me take you actually uh, to uh, to the example in India. Uh, you know, when stakeholders who are part of the implementation or action become part of the solution finding then we see that green economy transitions happen faster and they're more grounded and they're more fit to context. And we saw this in our India um, program. Uh, and I'll take you straight to the, to the work that we were doing on, along with the GC uh, and of course a whole number of partners in India uh, to a specific example of our work in Bihar which is the Eastern state in India, where the focus of our program was greening the construction sector, mainly brick sector. It's a sector dominated by the clay fired bricks, um, sector that leads to immense pollution and where the space was uh, being created to shift to a cleaner uh, production uh, process through introduction of new ways of uh, producing bricks and a new product, which was a fly ash based brick using uh, wastes from the thermal power uh, plants to produce, um, which produce no additional pollutants. Uh, the opportunity came primarily from the national policy space where um, there were regulations and there were guidelines that were put, in, put up for the states to start implementing uh, fly ash, uh, use of fly ash in, in construction. But there were many challenges. Uh, you know, the first one was the translation of uh, national policy intent to really the state implementation where data, evidence, supporting mechanisms, understanding of the practical barriers uh, and drivers you know, to, towards the shift. Uh, these, were the, these were problems that the state machinery had on their hands, but there also was a, a very interesting um, and I think very, very practical challenge that of information asymmetry between those who would implement this on the ground and be part of that solution, which was the producers, the entrepreneurs who would come in to produce green bricks, the fly, uh, fly ash bricks, and uh, how do they understand government orders and government decisions, and how do their concerns of market supply challenge and challenges of quality, etc., would get reflected in the government processes, and what was the trust building and the bridge, communication bridge between different actors. So we, uh, to, uh, along with the GC program, there were other uh, supporting initiatives that came together and we not only needed to conduct the local assessments and studies, but also to get the information and concerns of the actors on the ground to each other. And fortunately for us, the state government, two government bodies came across as champions. The state government was positive, which was a good thing. And the Department of Environment and Forests, Climate Change in, the, in Bihar and the Bihar State Pollution Control Board became the uh, champions. The first area of action was really to support these and a local a special interdepartmental task force uh, was constituted of which we played the role of a secretariat for quite some time. And we helped in building the scientific evidence from the ground. And in parallel, we were working with the local CSOs and the nascent small group of entrepreneurs who were trying to survive uh, in, in a very competitive market uh, with price disadvantages, with, uh, with very, very poor credit support, uh, irregular material supply. And so we had discussion processes that were set up between the Fly Ash Brick Association at the state level, linking them to the National Fly Ash Brick Association and the state level, um, uh, state, state level body. The first breakthrough really was the form formation beyond the task force was the formation of a state level mo monitoring committee, which included this interdepartmental task force, but also on the table were the fly ash entrepreneurs, along with the suppliers of fly ash, which is the, which, which is the mammoth national thermal power corporation uh, of India. So we had everybody on the table putting out their uh, uh, you know, concerns and discussing, trying to find solutions through varied means. There were meetings, there were workshops, there were seminars, uh, there were field visits. The second breakthrough really was the evidence from the ground. And this was where, you know, when 
the initiative started, it was much pushed, it was much more pushed by the climate change and the pollution agenda, the emissions agenda of the brick production sector. But what we found from the ground and um, the evidence showed that is, it is here, you know, that you almost 53 million tons of topsoil were being gobbled up by the fired clay uh, sector. Uh, and suddenly we had the government um, department set up because now you had conflict with the agriculture, the food production space. And we had much more uh, sort of buy-in and uh, the task force really came alive um, when these conflicts became evident. And it resulted in the state government issuing a number of orders and decisions that were aligned with the central notifications for cleaner production, but also created an enabling environment for the fly ash uh, brick sector in the state. So you had stringent rules for pollution management with the red brick uh, kiln owners, but you also had a new law that forbid any new brick kiln to come up in the state. And you had, in, you had uh, pressures on the brick industry to start shifting to cleaner technologies. Uh, the this, this space that the Fly Ash Brick Association found on the state government's uh, SLMC, it enabled the supply side concerns to be aired and, you know, uh, the concerns of quality, where the procurement end would talk about uh, small, you know, inadequate quantity and inadequate quality. And uh, here we had no technical support. So a quality rating system was designed, was set up, has been anchored in the building and construction department of the uh, state government. And, uh, you know, there, there are now almost 31 of these enterprises who are registered on this already. From the government's perspective, in normally it's the CSO or the intermediary who is the voice of the community. But in this case, we actually had the community of enterprises represented directly their, their uh, voice on the table and they could, um, they could have a dialogue and reach out to the government. And you have now 200 plus uh, MSMEs represented on this policy table. Uh, new orders on this uh, on supporting the enterprises were, were issued so we had an order for all public buildings within a hundred kilometer of the fly ash source who had to now who have to now use fly ash bricks in hundred percent of their construction this was contested in this in, in court and it was um, by the government but the fly ash association uh, managed to get an order from the National Green Tribunal uh, for it. We also had at the national level um, a lobby of the fly ash associations and other CSOs who were able to successfully get a shift and a change in the goods and services tax, the GST on fly ash bricks, reducing it from 18% to 5%, which gave a price advantage and a better playing field. We found that we've been able to amplify scientific evidence to change government perspective, better information flow, uh, uh, you know, more conducive to the context uh, policies at the state level. And I think what we've seen is that green economy actions have been, can be effectively shaped around local concerns and viability of running green enterprises. So it's, it's the greening, the, in greening the brick sector agenda, we've been able to integrate the SME as driving that agenda, which is, which is really the, the interesting part. We, we see a tremendous potential going forward in the post COVID recovery in the space. We see that the, the post COVID green recovery agenda would benefit from spaces such as these where the stakeholders can come together to co-create solutions, which will be fit to context. They will be longer lasting. They will take the real concerns of the real people on into account and they will build a recovery strategy that in a sense will be a stepping stone for the longer period transition to the green, greener and more inclusive and equitable economy, which is really where we want to go using the recovery as as a base thank you that's great thank you very much Zina. and re really great to hear about the sort of the progress from the dialogues through to influencing policy there i'd like to turn now to uh, luis prado from peru so good morning to you uh luis good, mor good morning laura uh, thank you for the opportunity um warm regards uh, to everybody from lima peru 
Our story started a bit more than three years ago and has as the main actor, a group of micro, small and medium enterprises, MSMEs, that are creating a positive impact on the world through their enterprises. So why did we choose to focus our actions on green MSMEs? We believe that they are accelerators for the transition to an inclusive green economy. And during these COVID times, would also be a very, very important actor for the recuperation of our very, very uh, worn down economy. MSMEs are a key actor in the Peruvian society. They represent 99% of all enterprises and contribute to 80% of the economic active population and 40% of the gross domestic product. They are an important source of innovation and a vital driver for growth. But they're also very vulnerable. Most of them are informal. Only 6% of them have access to fin formal financial uh, in, um, activities. And 50% of all enterprises don't make it through the first year. They need all the help that they can get, but very often they are at the bottom of the government's priority. By supporting them, we create a positive impact on a large part of our population many of whom depend on these small businesses as their own source of income. Therefore, what have we done? The Green Economy Coalition Peru has become an important ally for green MSMEs. We are empowering them to improve their competitiveness and resilience with the aim of increasing the number of green enterprises in the market. We have created a community to make them stronger, to give them a voice, to help them create synergies, solve common obstacles and attract new opportunities for all. And how did we achieve this? Our first action was getting to know the green MSMEs. We carried out dialogue process, processes through dialogue uh, breakfast meetings to understand their challenges and top needs we learned that they struggle from lack of visibility, that they need informed consumers that can understand the value they create, that they lack access to financing alternatives, that they lack government support and incentives, and that they feel alone and neglected, struggling to make it on their own. With this in mind, we focus our actions in three fronts, connecting, communicating, and influencing. We generated spaces for the community to connect with each other, with organizations that could open up new opportunities for them and with responsible consumers. We communicated the benefits of the green economy by exposing real cases from our community, by participating in conferences and workshops, writing case studies and carrying out press campaigns. We influenced policymakers by developing alliances with key actors by interacting with them through dialogue spaces, events, and documents that exposes the entrepreneur's voice. To date, we have a stronger community of more than 220 MSMEs that are attracting new opportunities for all. Our platform receives more than 500 visitors each day, giving visibility and connecting the green businesses with responsible consumers. We gave support to Congressman Alberto de la Unde to pass his project law for collective benefit con enterprises, which very recently has become a law that will give a legal status to enterprises that provide benefits to society, distinguishing them from those that don't. This law will give a positive impact in four of the most important barriers for green MSMEs identified in the beginning of this project. We are a clear evidence that the green economy is a reality in Peru, and the bigger we get, the more relevant we become to demand changes we need to accelerate this transition. Throughout this process, we learn many things. And, that, and one that really stands out for me is how grateful some of these entrepreneurs are just knowing that we are there for them. They feel they're alone on their hard journey of being an entrepreneur here in Peru. The confidence they have gained by knowing that they're not alone, that someone cares, has been an important source of strength to carry on through difficult times. 
I wish to transmit their gratitude to the European Commission for International Cooperation and Development, to IIED and the Green Economy Coalition Family and Allies for making their lives better, and in doing so, helping to create a better world. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lewis. That's really nice of you to uh, to send the um, the good wishes from the uh, entrepreneurs you've been working with. But a really great story of very concrete um, outcomes from the work. I mean, the fact that these enterprises now have recognition as a sort of a, a for benefit company, uh, and it's very much in in line with trends that we're seeing across the world. We're seeing big international companies becoming for benefit, but actually, when you're doing that at the level of small scale entrepreneurs in Peru. I think that, that that's really great. So we're now going to sort of open up and um, have a, a panel discussion. And so we've got um, uh, Thibo and um, uh, Najma joining us. And um, I'm going to sort of start with uh, a couple of questions um, to them to, to, to enable them to say a little bit about their sort of perspectives. And then we'll sort of open up to a sort of a, a broader um, uh, dialogue uh, and questions uh, from you in the audience. So um, Najma, uh, I'd like to start by asking you, what are some of the key lessons from the dialogues for uh, inclusive green policy making? We just heard some great examples from um, India and uh, Peru, but what about more broadly uh, across the work, across the dialogue work? Thank you, Laura, and uh, wishing everybody a warm good day where, wherever you're joining us from. So I was in the fortunate position that when I started with the Green Economy Coalition now more than a year and a half, well, about a year and a half ago, I had um, the wonderful opportunity of working with the hubs and, and beginning to distill the lessons from the dialogue processes. And, and I think, you know, the stories, you know, they speak for themselves. But I know, Laura, you started our conversation that we are facing, you know, the difficult um, fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of the social and economic vulnerabilities that, that Zinat and, and Louise spoke to actually have been amplified and have become more visible. But this has been a moment for us to really take a hard look at our economies and, and to build forward and, and plan and design policies for a greener and, and a fairer world. And I think that the challenge that, that we have is, is that, you know, this transition has been underway. We've seen in the last decade, more than 80 countries have actually enacted, you know, green economy policies and plans and strategies, um, sectoral greening plans, to take us on a pathway. And fortunately now we've got, I think the whole world on board to, to, to tackle the climate crisis. So we know that this is something urgent, this is something serious. But the policy making process has often been a very technocratic, very top down planning process. And we've heard the incredible experiences from Peru, from India, how this can be different and how this can influence um, the outcome you know, of policies. And, and now more than ever, we need inclusion to form a meaningful part of, our, of both our transition and, and our recovery pathways. And policies really only matter if, if they reflect society's real long-term needs and wants, if governments implement their commitment to inclusion, and if people can hold their governments to account. And I think the GEC hubs, and I would welcome all of you to read the full report to, to get the lessons from the incredible stories um, that the hub share actually highlight a number of, of insights, but I'll try to just um, zoom in on, on three. Inclusive transition to a green economy will not come about through one off policy consultations. This is not a tick box exercise. This is not bullet five in our principles of, you know, a inclusive green economy transition. This has to be given real meaning and real life and embedded in, in governance systems. The visions, the, the political um, commitment, the political will is an important part of shaping this framework. But as we create this enabling you know, policy um, environment, um, I think Zina shared the fantastic example of an intergovernmental um, task force of, of, of this being mainstreamed across government that it gets you know, from the vertical down to the, um, from the national to the state to the local level actually give, gets given meaning. And we need to understand concretely that, that inclusion is not only a principle that should be driving our transition, but should also be a key outcome. We, we have to understand what is this really going to mean? Um, what does it mean? How will it impact people? How will women, young people, informal workers, um, small enterprises benefit from this transition? Who will benefit and access to green jobs? How would we access the research and innovation that's, that's driving this transition? So we have to embed 
um, inclusion throughout our governance systems um, in, that, that drive our transition. I think the second lesson, and, and this also came out from the stories that, that, that we should, we need to understand how, the how of inclusion. We need institutional innovations. In most of the countries where the hubs were working, there were very few institutional structures or processes in place to facilitate participatory policy making. And the green economy dialogue platforms that were set up, uh, the action learning groups in, in the Caribbean, the green imbizos um, in, in South Africa, the uh, breakfast meetings, the, the dialogue um, policy tables that, that, that Zina referred to, they've all either expanded or created entirely new spaces for policy dialogue. And this has given citizens, um, entrepreneurs, farmers, rural communities, a greater stake in the policy making processes. And I think that this, the dialogues really provided an opportunity to bring voices that would otherwise have gone completely unheard into the policy making processes. And I think that inclusive outcomes are highly unlikely if we don't have processes, structures, and mechanisms that involve people. And, and fortunately, I think the green economy dialogues that the GEC has been supporting is part of a bigger trend that we see through citizens' climate assemblies, through the just transition movements, um, so through social dialogue structures that are beginning to bring citizen and society voice into the policymaking process. And, and I think thirdly, this was highlighted incredibly well in, in, in the stories that the connection between local action and policy change is possible. And it's been all the hubs, you know, in the discussions that I had with them, the opportunities to sit and listen to their stories said that this is one of one of the goals, you know, one of the greatest uh, success in factors for, for them is, is getting, you know, those voices um, into, into the process. And the dialogues have brought local green economy priorities and plans into the policy making processes. And I think the hubs have displayed this incredible agility of engaging diverse stakeholders, of building the kind of alliances that you need, um, of taking the voices at village catchment level, enterprise level, into the discussion with policymakers in the district, state, national level, and with business and, and industry associations. And I think policy comes to life in places. It, it gets the, the vision gets set at a certain level, but they, they come into life and they get translated um, uh, into action in Bihar, um, in, in Lima. So the GEC hubs have really done an incredible job in, in bringing people's voices in, into the policy pr process. And, and just I'd love to echo something that the, my colleague Stuart started with, is that governments, institutions, businesses, there's a broad recognition that the need for social inclusion has to be there. We see it in our vision documents. It's, it's right up there with the sort of big goals that we, that we want to, but there is still an assumption that particip these participatory processes are gonna slow down implementation. They're gonna be cumbersome. They, they're gonna be a roadblock you know, to implementation. I think the results from the dialogues really show that inclusive processes result in a faster transition Yes, they are, there's efficiency, there's effectiveness. And, and I think, I hope Zina, we get a chance to speak about this um, because for me, it's been incredible to, to hear the stories from Uganda, from India, South Africa, Peru, how the work that's been done in the three years in this difficult moment that we're facing in economic recovery actually has an opportunity to feed into this recovery process and make sure that it's inclusive, just and, and, and sustainable. Um, and I think Laura, let me perhaps um, stop there and, and perhaps have an opportunity later to share some more of the, of the insights as we get into more dialogue and, and discussion. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thank you. And a really, you know, intu you know enthusiasing and um, positive set of uh, lessons coming out from you know, what, what's been a huge amount of work. And you talked about holding government and sort of you know, how institutional structures can facilitate inclusion. So I'd like to um, bring Thibault into the conversation now. And Thibault, ask you about what you see as the sort of the role of institutions in, in um, supporting sort of green transition or green recovery uh, at scale. Thank you, Laura, and uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to say I'm very pleased to be participating in this event. Uh, because the uh, the topic and the, the green recovery, inclusive recovery, is very much a part of our priorities as well uh, for the Commission at the moment. And also, personally, I've been working with GC for several years. Uh, we've had uh, this project in common uh, since several years. It's really uh, great to hear the, the stories from the partners who are implementing this action over the last years 
and to see the, the results which have been achieved. So to answer your question, I would like to refer uh, a bit to uh, EU's approach uh, on inclusion in the context of the recovery and also in the context of our international cooperation. Uh, so first on the recovery, I'd like to start by saying a few words on the Green Deal. Uh, I think many of you probably heard about this uh, EU agenda, an agenda for sustainable growth, which at the same time uh, contribute to tackle uh, the environment and the climate crisis. So I think the environmental dimension of the Green Deal is well known. Uh, the inclusion component is perhaps not uh, as well known, but it's quite, uh, it's quite a prominent uh, component of the Green Deal. Uh, there is in particular the Just Transition Fund uh, as one of the key uh, tools under the Green Deal, uh, which, uh, as the na name uh, says, it's about a just and inclusive uh, green transition. So here the focus is on regions, industries, workers who are most affected by the transition, um, and the support entails uh, promoting jobs in new sectors or the jobs in, the, in sectors in, the, in transition, reskilling of workers, uh, developing or supporting energy efficient housing, uh, promoting access to clean and affordable energy. So the fund has a budget or the, the, the ambition is to, uh, to mobilize 150 billion euros. And so I think that gives uh, an idea of the scale and the level of importance of inclusion in the context of the Green Deal. I'd like to refer quickly to a quote from our Vice President, uh, Franz Timmermans. He said on the Green Deal that we must show solidarity with the most affected regions in Europe, such as coal mining regions and others, to make sure the Green Deal gets everyone full support and has a chance to become a reality. So I like this, uh, this statement because it shows that the, the inclusion component in the Green Deal, of course, it's a question of fairness, but it's also a, question, uh, a condition to deliver. Basically, if there is no inclusion, there cannot be support from society. Therefore, no support for decision makers from, politi from politicians, and in this case, no de Green Deal implemented. Um, now, let me say a few words on the, on the green recovery, which is very much uh, driven by the Green Deal. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the Green Deal, uh, despite the crisis context, not only has remained a priority for the EU, but it, it's actually, um, it is actually one of the main uh, it, it, it is really driving the, uh, the recovery plan of the EU. So the recovery plan uh, reflects, again, the green dimension and the inclusion dimension. Uh, for instance, uh, under the EU recovery plan, there's a high ambition in terms of expenditure uh, for climate and environment action, 30% of the total budget of, this, uh, of the recovery and resilience facility. That's the, uh, one of the main initiatives under the recovery plan. Uh, additional money has been allocated to the just transition mechanism. There's also been some loans to member states uh, to address the, the sudden increase of expenditure related to employment or to safeguard employment. So I think that uh, that confirms the green and inclusion dimension of, the, of, of our activities on recovery. Now we'd like to move quickly to the inclusion in the context of our cooperation. Um, inclusion and, in general, inequalities and tackling poverty, these are the overarching objectives of our development cooperation and our development policy. Uh, we do this through action in different areas, for example, supporting employment, the decent work agenda, vocational education and training, uh, but it's broader than that. It's also, for example, territorial and urban development, uh, environment activities, social protection, and one of the points I would like to stress here, it's also democracy and the rule of law, which, which for us means, uh, in this context, participatory decision making, effective, accountable institutions. Um, and we've seen this uh, reflected in practice because over the years, if we take our cooperation, maybe what it was uh, 10, 15 or 20 years ago, many of our uh, NGO partners, and they were essentially implementing partners uh, to deliver uh, some cooperation projects. Uh, this has changed a lot. Today we see very much uh, civil society organizations as active players in the decision making processes of the partner countries where we work. And so our role as a public institution with the development agenda is to promote this. So we're doing this through different ways, uh, promoting and trying to ensure uh, CSO sit in the, uh, in the development of uh, policy processes in governance mechanisms. 
uh, to reinforce their capacities, networks of uh, civil society organization, of local authorities, for instance, and also education, awareness raising, uh, based on the understanding that well-informed populations are also more inclined to support sustainable development. So to conclude, I think it's interesting because here, what I'm saying, I think it's exactly uh, what the previous speakers have explained about the work with the, with the Green Economy Coalition. For example, the development of the hubs, uh, reinforcing the capacities, uh, reinforcing the networks, so they have a stronger influence. Uh, this is very much what has been done over the last years by, by, by the, the Green Economy Coalition. So I think uh, this work, which is presented today, is an excellent illustration of what we are trying to do uh, with civil society in, our, in the context of our cooperation. And to conclude, um, I would like to, to get back to my first message when I was saying I was, uh, I was glad to be here because we've been working for around four or five years with Green Economy Coalition, uh, with financial support from the Commission to, to support and develop these, uh, these regional hubs. Uh, I'm pleased to say that after that, uh, very recently, we've just signed a new contract uh, with IED for a new phase of this work of the Green Economy Coalition. I think that confirms uh, our, uh, our commitment to inclusion in the context of our cooperation on green economy and also our positive or uh, yes, positive feedback on all which has been achieved and just presented by the colleagues uh, and which is also in the, in the report which has been uh, published. So maybe I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention and I'm happy to, to get back to you if there are some questions or comments. Thanks. Thank you, Tuba. A really great to hear that sort of um, endorsement um, from the, the Commission of, of support for this approach by the, the new grant that, that you mentioned there, but also to hear about you know, how you're thinking about this in the European context as well. You know, inclusion is something that is as important in Brussels as it is in Lima, as important as it is in uh, Warsaw as, as it is in Delhi. So um, I'd like to really encourage people to um, start putting uh, questions into the Q&A box and I'm going to turn to those in a moment. But I just wanted to very quickly ask, first of all, uh, Zinat and then Luis for just a sort of a, a one word, one or two words in, in response, you know, what you've just been hearing. What do you think the key support that, that local organisations and communities need to undertake inclusive dialogues in, in this sort of COVID recovery context? So, Zina, just a couple of words from you on that first, but others, please do get your questions into the box. What I would say is the most important thing is a place on the table and not really uh, just a, a token place on the table, but the place on the table with the mic. Uh, so, the, so, so that's, I think, the most important thing because you then are able to voice your concern and be heard. Uh, most, I think the biggest issue is that we are making programs and schemes and strategies uh, sitting in New Delhi or sitting in the state capital, but uh, we forget that there on ground struggles, uh, those are barriers that we don't understand. And we can only understand those barriers if we have actors on the ground uh, on the table with us. Uh, and we give them that due um, you know, respect uh, to be able to, uh, re and, and respond to those concerns. That's great, thank you, Zina. Luis, same question. Thank you. Um, well, I believe that a very important uh, issue is to have someone to lead the dialogue process, someone that can present an idea, communicate it, and bring people together. But I must add that, that it's very relevant that, that they have a purpose that is very relevant for the participants um, to, to, to bring them together. I, I think that including uh, authority figures may also be of much help um, and, and someone that, that registers the information presented, that processes this information and distributes it to relevant stakeholders is, is key for, the, for, for, for this to carry on. And, and having someone that takes action in relation to the information shared and that communicates it communicates it to the participants is very important for engaging them in further participation. 
that that's very that's very uh, insightful and i think these are the kinds kinds of things that we do need to be learning uh, from and thinking about um, as this work goes forward. So uh, now turning to uh, our audience, I'd really encourage people, we've got a few questions coming in, but really like to encourage some more to be bring perspectives. I can see we have participants from across the world. So it would be great if people have thoughts on their own national context and, and what it might make, um, what it might make most sense for um, us to be sharing. So um, moving to those questions, um, looking at the ones that have been voted uh, to the top, uh, Steve Bass um, highlighting he appreciates um, the work that the dialogues have focused very much on the positives of, of inclusion and that there are many, many wins that you can achieve. Uh, but how do they address exclusion? Um, you know, the really tough issues of inequality. Very often, you know, you talked about somebody having uh, the mic seen out, but how, how often do we find we're in a situation where people just don't have uh, a voice? So how do we, um, how do we enable ourselves to, um, to support that? So um, I'd like to uh, perhaps uh, ask you, Nadja, about that, because you, you've, um, in producing the report, been looking at um, quite a lot of the uh, the lessons that have come more broadly. You know, what do you think are some of the key things around uh, the exclu exclusion? I think that it takes time to get everybody to the table. I, I, in all the discussions that we've had with with hubs, and, and I can, I guess, Zina, you can it's, um, to reflect on as as much as you needed to have a conversation with the um, the, new, the new entrants to to the sector and and the people that are wanting to change. Um, the brick making sector, there needs to be a conversation with the, the red brick manufacturers and, and, and entrepreneurs and how they would feel about their jobs, you know, being lost. We had this discussion in, in Uganda that as they are speaking about um, activities around the, along the catchment that can help them build and, and keep the health um, of this catchment that affects, you know, 15 districts along this river. How do they actually address uh, um, the families, the livelihoods uh, that are, are destructive, you know, that that, that are also depending on, on that and how do you get buy-in and, and understanding that you need to shift. I think it takes time. I don't think that inclusive processes are built through one project cycle. I mean, I, I think what I've really, really enjoyed from the story of, of development alternatives and, and your work in Bihar, um, Zenit, has been that it's a long process. It started way before a project even started in, um, and, and, and this takes time. But I think what is, uh, I think the hubs um, are very alert to the issue that, that they need to build this uh, and deepen um, this inclusion that as much as you want to know, to get people along, around the table, get them the mic, you've got to know that there are people also in the streets, in the uh, people that, that feel that they don't have, have a voice. But um, Zinat, I'd, I'd love you know your perspective on this because I know that it came up in the India um, story. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, and thank you, Steve, for that question. You know, unfortunately, um, even being on the table, you know, democracy is, uh, is not a perfect uh, space. Uh, if I may say so, but, you know, crowding out of the small voice is quite possible and exclusion is quite possible. And I think the point that Louis had made about a constant facilitation and a constant, um, in a sense, um, uh, awareness of this fact is the only uh, sort of caution we have. And at the same time, this uh, point that you are raising, Najma, about uh, uh, the red brick sector, being threatened. Yes, of course. I mean, it was not, it's not been an easy process. Even before, I mean, you know that the work began much, much before the GC program. We were, but we were looking at it mainly from, you know, the climate uh, and CO2 angle and cleaner production and trying to get enterprises uh, initiated. Um, the, the state level structure had, had come up, the, the, the task force, at, which is an interdepartmental structure. Like I mentioned, the breakthrough really came when the when the state level task force actually got rep, was represented along with the entrepreneurs on that SLMC, which is where you know the dialogues became tense at times, um, and it was they were not always very pleasant. We were always two steps forward, one step back. Uh, there was also an intra um, entrepreneur conflict even within the enterprise association because there was competition for a very limited at that time small market 
uh, and everybody was gearing for that. And the, the idea was that the market has to, that pie has to grow so that, so that the flyash entrepreneurs are able to get more space, but also the transition for the red brick is, is enabled. So as the orders for banning red bricks and shifting them came into place, the possibilities of how they could move and you know, where is the credit to, to get more capital to, to change from the, where, what they're doing. And that uh, is also an, a, a step-by-step -step process. So that is happening simultaneously. It's not really easy. It's still in, in that sense, in, in, you know, very much work in progress. For, but, it, but I think it's the, the movement, the momentum has begun. And um, I personally don't think we can, we can any longer say that you know, there will be uh, casualties. And so those are casualties of the green economy transition. No, we have to look at the justice of the transition. But, uh, and there is no way out without inclusion. There will be no green economy long lasting if there is no inclusion. So that's what, you know, we have to, we have to take these as given and move with them to find solutions for it. Thank you, Zina. I, th I think that's right. Um, green will not be successful if it is not uh, inclusive. Um, some good questions coming in now. Um, interesting one. Um, this is from uh, Clara Axblad, um, thanking uh, you all for the, the discussion. Um, what, in your view, are some of the key actions that international organisations can take to support countries in ensuring green recovery measures are truly inclusive? Uh, Luis, I'd like to uh, put that one to you first. Well, I, th I think that it, working on to the uh, on parallel levels is very important. Um, in, in, at the government level, it's very important to to interact with the decision makers and and help them uh, have the the tools and 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 the abilities to 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 make some um, changes uh, relevant for, for this new situation. But also you need people on the ground, people that, that are in constant um, contact with the people that are being, uh, uh, have the, 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 are being affected by, by this, this situation. Uh, and in the sense of hearing uh, what they need and putting this information directly to the people that can do something about it. So it's, it's very important to, to, to work in a parallel um, uh, action to, to make sure that the needs are really solved at the end by the decisions that decision makers make. So, so it, it's, it's a kind of a parallel uh, work that you have to do to, to, to make sure that the changes that you do are really uh, important and that can really solve the problems that the people need. Okay, yeah, so, so things, things need to happen to, together. So it, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a collaborative action that, that's required and Sorry? international organ, organizations have a role to, to play in that. I've uh, got another question yeah. here uh, directed uh, at you, Thibault. Um, uh, it's a very good one because um, it's from Sonia Moreno at IUCN. There's a lot of talk about green recovery, but actually a lot of that seems to be very focused on, on, on climate measures. So reducing CO2 emissions, but not sort of uh, nature loss more generally. Um, what do you think is missing for more green recovery plans that take a wider perspective um, uh, of nature and sustainability? Why are we not seeing more of those? And, and particularly, why are we perhaps not seeing a bit more of that in the EU's own sort of uh, green recovery? Well, I think if we look at the, um, our experience on the EU side and the, the recovery plan, of course, there is a strong focus on climate action. Um, but I think the, the importance of the other Green Deal priorities are also quite well reflected. And if you look at the Green Deal, I think there is some balance between action related to climate change specifically, but other components, for example, action on biodiversity, and more broadly, the greening of various economic, um, of various economic sectors. Um, I, I think the, 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 uh, the importance, of course, is to make the links between the different, uh, the different uh, areas of uh, action. I think there's a growing understanding that uh, if there are no functioning ecosystems, uh, action on climate change is pretty much uh, useless or won't, uh, won't achieve the, the results needed. Um, but this needs to be, uh, to be known more, more broadly. But again, referring to our experience, I have the, the feeling that 
uh, there's quite a strong momentum around biodiversity, the summit and the CBD summit uh, next year. So it seems to me that there's a, a fast growing understanding of the importance of ecosystems, uh, the natural capital uh, as part of the broader, of the response to the broader, um, the broader environment and climate crisis. Now, when it comes to promoting this, for example, in the context of our cooperation, um, I think the, one of the key aspects is the, uh, the, the job, uh, uh, the employment impact. Uh, there is a very good paper from UNEP, actually it's a, it's a short note, uh, really showing uh, the importance of environmental sustainability across various economic sectors, including some uh, with, uh, with strong potential uh, for biodiversity, for example, sustainable tourism. Um, and how green practices across various sectors, whether it's tourism, energy, uh, food production, uh, how much that contributes to job creation uh, compared with more traditional or business as usual models. So I think the evidence and the monitoring are also uh, essential to, to encourage uh, any country to, to be ambitious on this front. Okay, no, that, I, that, that, that's, really, that's really good to hear. Uh, we are really out of time, but I just wanted to sort of go around each of our speakers to just uh, share one final reflection on this discussion. It's been really rich and there's no way I would try to, to, um, to summarize it. We've heard a lot of really good experience from the local level. We've heard how we need to work at different levels. We, we've heard the perspective of, uh, of the European um, Commission. So um, perhaps going back to the beginning, Stuart, a final thought reaction to one of the questions um observation from yourself um, i'd just like to 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 close by uh, responding to steve's question he asks about the excluded the excluded are those that hold probably the most critical data as to why the system is not working if you don't in include the excluded, you miss out on a massive data set, which therefore means that your response is going to be skewed and it is unlikely to be successful. The methods that we use to do this is what we call participatory system mapping. And we walk through systems and we deliberately try and find what we call hidden people, people who are not in the space where they would normally come and we bring their voice also amongst the others to these policy platforms. And what we have seen is that there have been pivots where data that was not seen suddenly comes in and pivots an entire conversation and you reach a tipping point where suddenly there is a dramatic and rapid change. So the issue then of exclusion is not, uh, again, a nice to have. It means if we are not including the excluded, we are missing out critical data and I hope if anybody gets the chance to read this report, you can see where tipping points are reached because the excluded voice is now included. Thank you. That's great, Stuart. Really good to hear about that practical way to bring the excluded into, into the conversation. Sinat, final thoughts mm -hmm. from you. Very quickly, two points. One, I think the how, and Najma had pointed, put a finger to it, where that we need these spaces, but we need them structured. So, you know, you can actually go forward in, in designing for inclusive spaces, spaces that include at the local level, include the local and the subnational together, include the subnational and the national together. So you need these at designed and structured spaces actively working. So you need the vertical and the horizontal integration for that inclusion to really happen. Uh, that's one. The second, I think, is a point about beyond carbon mitigation, beyond climate, the indicators for uh, conflicts with other sectors, ecosystems. Uh, so, you know, when we looked at soil versus, versus um, brick production, and you, you really found that it was, it's, it's not just about CO2, it's also about the fact that you were conflicting with, with food production and agriculture and job creation and human health. I think those are indicators that we need to include in, in our larger green um, criteria, which unfortunately are not there in all of our processes. And, and we need to include them in designing strategies, especially procurement strategies and um, new sector uh, growth credit strategies, for example. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, 
very, very important that sometimes we don't think about those 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 interlinkages green and sustainable agriculture is is, is key to, to to co2 emissions as well uh luis um final thoughts from you well i i believe that you need more um, I, I don't, are you hearing me because i i, I see yes yeah okay. yeah you're, you're you're still here you're still with us <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> My internet is not working so well. Um, I believe that you need people or organizations that are in the middle, that, that serves as bridges. Because I, I, know, I believe that there are a lot of actions from the government or for international organizations trying to put forward um, a lot of uh, activities. And there's also lots of needs uh, on the ground uh, to, to, to conquer this sustainable world. But many of these actions don't really reach the, the, uh, the um, people on the ground. So you need people that are constantly uh, connecting with people on the ground and giving this information uh, from, the, from down, downwards upwards to the, to the government. So the government has uh, very uh, insightful and, and real uh, up-to-date information for their actions. Um, it, it's very important to have a, a middle stage organization or, or people that can bridge all this uh, information from one way to the other. No, but I, I think that's very good. And that's very, very, very real in, in, in many countries. The reality of um, citizens, many votes not recognized by their, their governments. I don't know anything like that, but Thibaut, from the European Commission perspective, what would your final thoughts be? Well, my last remark will be um, to refer to the uh, Inclusion Matter report. Um, I think it's a very good uh, explanation and demonstration of how inclusion uh, works. And I find it very useful because um, in GDEFCO at the European Commission, well, we don't like to be called a donor, but uh, we are a financial contributor to, uh, to many projects. And I think inclusion is one area where it's particularly difficult uh, to have tangible and well-documented results on how these processes can actually improve policy design, policy implementation. Um, and I think this report is an excellent uh, contribution to address this, uh, this challenge. So I would invite everybody to have a good look at the, at the report. That's great. Thank you, Tiba. I was purposely leaving Najma to the end so she could sort of, you know, mention the, the link to the report, but really great, you know, tangible and well-documented results. Uh, you know, that, that's a, a great endorsement from you and, and, and really credit to, to the team, to all of my colleagues are here. But, Najma, a, a final word from you. Thank you, Tiba. I'm going to say something completely different. I, I think planning and investing in, in a green recovery or green transition without inclusion, it's both unjust and, and risky. And, and I think that we've got some voices and, and movements now that are demanding uh, for the inclusion of citizen perspectives and citizen voice in, in, in our plans and our policies and, and our processes. And I think we need to strengthen these alliances. We need the voices of the young people on, on, on the streets. We need um, the voices of people that are calling you know, for energy democracy and for food sovereignty to join um, the, the, this um, call for, for inclusive um, green economies. And I think we, we're on the way there, but it's really a moment that um, this voice needs to um, go to its maximum reach its maximum volume to be heard in this incredible moment that we all, we're all um, living through. It's a moment for, for immense change. Thank you. That's, good. That's great, Najma. That's a great call to action and a great, great point for us to, to end on. Hopefully uh, the participants in this webinar have also been inspired um, because we do face a huge challenge, but we also have a huge opportunity. And you know the work that the GEC has been doing with the support of the European Commission highlights uh, how it's possible. And I do being very proud to work with GEC and to co-host this webinar. So thank you very much to our panelists. Really appreciate in the evening, and to all of our um, uh, participants in the webinar. Take a look at the report. Thank you very much. Get in touch. We look forward to continuing to working with you on this agenda. Bye bye. Thank you.